Frederick Douglass Learning to Read and Write. Frederick Douglass was born a slave in 1818 in Maryland. He learned to read and write, escaped to New York, and became a leader in the abolitionist movement. He engaged in speaking tours and edited North Star, a newspaper named for the one guide escaping Southern slaves could rely on to find their way to freedom. Douglass is best known for his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, from which learning to read and write is excerpted. In this selection, Douglass tells the story of his coming to literacy. As you read, keep your eye on the ways in which Douglass describes the world opening up for him as he learns his letters and the range of emotions this process evokes in him. I lived in Master Hugh's family about seven years. During this time, I succeeded in learning to read and write. In accomplishing this, I was compelled to resort to various stratagems. I had no regular teacher. My mistress, who had kindly commenced to instruct me, had in compliance with the advice and direction of her husband, not only ceased to instruct, but had set her face against me being instructed by anyone else. It is due, however, to my mistress to say of her that she did not adopt this course of treatment immediately. She at first lacked the depravity indispensable of shut shutting me up in mental darkness. It was at least necessary for her to have some training in the exercise of irresponsible power, to make her equal to the task of treating me as though I were a brute. My mistress was, as I have said, a kind and tender-hearted woman, and in the simplicity of her soul she commenced, when I first went to live with her, to treat me as she supposed one human being ought to treat another. And entering upon the duties of a slaveholder, she did not seem to perceive that I sustained to her the isolation of mere chattel, and that for her to treat me as a human being was not only wrong, but dangerously so. Slavery proved as injurious to her as it did to me. When I went there, she was a pious, warm, and tender-hearted woman. There was no sorrow or suffering for which she had not a tear. She had bread for the hungry, clothes for the naked, and comfort for every mourner that came within her reach. Slavery soon proved its ability to divest her of these heavenly qualities. Under its influence, the tender heart became stone, and the lamb-like disposition gave way to one of tire-like fierceness. The first step in her downward course was in her ceasing to instruct me. She now commenced to practice her husband's precepts. She finally became even more violent in her opposition than her husband himself. She was not satisfied with simply doing as well as he had commanded. She seemed anxious to do better. Nothing seemed to make her more angry than to see me with a newspaper. She seemed to think that here lay the danger. I have had her rush at me with a face made all up of fury and snatched from me a newspaper in a manner that fully revealed her apprehension. She was an apt woman, and a little experience soon demonstrated to her satisfaction that education and slavery were incompatible with each other. From this time, I was most narrowly watched. If I was in a separate room any considerable length of time, I was sure to be suspected of having a book, and was at once called to give an account of myself. All this, however, was too late. The first step had been taken. Mistress, in teaching me the alphabet, had given me the, the inch, and no precaution could prevent me from taking the L. The plan which I adopted, and the one by which I was most successful, was that of making friends of all the little white boys whom I met in the street. As many of these as I could, I converted into teachers. With their kindly aid, obtained at different times and in different places, I finally succeeded in learning to read. When I was sent of errands, I quickly took my book with I always took my book with me. And by going one part of my errand quickly, I found time to get a lesson before my return. I used to always carry bread with me, enough of which was always in the house, and to which I was always welcome, for I was much better off in this regard than many of the poor white children in our neighborhood. This bread I used to bestow upon the hungry little urchins who in return would give me that more valuable bread of knowledge. I am strongly tempted to give the names of two or three of those little boys as a testimonial of the gratitude and affection I bear them. But prudence forbids, not that it would injure me, but it might embarrass them, for it is almost an unpardonable offense to teach slaves to read in this Christian country. It is enough to say of the dear little fellows that they lived on Philpot Street, very near Durgan and Bailey's shipyard. I used to talk this matter of slavery over with them. I would sometimes say to them, I wished I could be as free as they would be when they got to be men. You'll be free as soon as you're 21, but I am a slave for life. Have not I as good a right to be free as you have? These words used to trouble them. They would express me for the liveliest sympathy and console me with the hope that something would occur by which I might be free. I was now about 12 years old, and the thought of being a slave for life began to bear heavily upon my heart. Just about this time, I got a hold of a book entitled The Columbian Orator. Every opportunity I got, I used to read this book. Among much of other interesting matter, I found in it a dialogue between a master and his slave. The slave was represented as having run away from his master three times. The dialogue represented the conversation which took place between them when the slave was retaken the third time. 
In this dialogue, the whole argument in behalf of slavery was brought forward by the master, all of which was disposed of the slave. The slave was made to say some very smart as well impressive things in reply to his master, things which had the desired though unexpected effect, for the conversation resulted in the voluntary emancipation of the slave on the part of the master. In the same book, I met with one of Sheridan's mighty speeches on in behalf of Catholic emancipation. These were choice documents to me. I read them over and over again with unabated interest. They gave tongue to interesting thoughts of my own soul, which had frequently lashed through my mind and died away for want of utterance. The moral which I gained from the dialogue was the power of truth over the conscience of even a slaveholder. What I got from Sheridan was bold denunciation of slavery and a powerful vindication of human rights. The reading of these documents enabled me to utter my thoughts and to meet the arguments brought forward to sustain slavery. But while they relieved me of one difficulty, they brought on another even more painful than the one of which I was relieved. The more I read, the more I was led to abhor and detest my enslavers. I regarded them in no other light than a band of successful robbers who had left their homes and gone to Africa and stolen us from our homes and in a strange land reduced us to slavery. I loathed them as being the meanest as well as the most wicked of men. As I read and contemplated the subject, behold, that very discontentment which Master Hugh had predicted would follow my learning to read had already come, to torment and sting my soul to unutterable anguish. As I writhed under it, I would at times feel that learning to read had been a curse rather than a blessing. It had given me a view of my wretched condition. Without the remedy, it opened my eyes to the horrible pit, but to no ladder upon which to get out. In moments of agony, I envied my fellow slaves for their stupidity. I have often wished myself a beast. I prefer the condition of the meanest reptile to my own. Anything, no matter what, to get rid of thinking. It was this everlasting thinking of my condition that tormented me. There was no getting rid of it. It was pressed upon me by every object within sight or hearing, animate or inanimate. The silver trump of freedom had roused my soul to eternal wakefulness. Freedom now appeared to disappear no more forever. It was heard in every sound and seen in everything. It was ever present to torment me with a sense of my wretched condition. I saw nothing without seeing it. I heard nothing without hearing it, and I felt nothing without feeling it. It looked from every star, it smiled in every calm, breathed in every wind, and moved in every storm. I often found myself regretting my own existence and wishing myself dead, and but for the hope of being free, I have no doubt that I should have killed myself or done something for which I should have been killed. While in this state of mind, I was eager to hear anyone speak of slavery. I was a ready listener. Every little while, I could hear something about the abolitionists. It was some time before I found what the word meant. It was always used in such connections as to make it an interesting word to me. If a slave ran away and succeeded in getting clear, or if a slave killed his master, set fire to a barn, or did anything very wrong in the mind of a slaveholder, it was spoken of as the fruit of abolition. Hearing the word in this connection very often, I set about learning what it meant. The dictionary afforded me little or no help. I found it was the act of abolishing, but then I did not... No, what was to be abolished. Here I was perplexed. I did not dare to ask my, anyone about its meaning, for I was satisfied that it was something they wanted me to know very little about. After a patient waiting, I got one of our city papers containing an account of the number of petitions from the North, praying for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, and of the slave trade between the states. From this time, I understood the words abolition and abolitionist, and always drew near when that word was spoken, expecting to hear something of importance to myself and fellow slaves. The light broke in upon me by degrees. I went one day down the wharf of Mr. Waters, and seeing two Irishmen and loading a scow of stone, I went unasked and helped them. When we had finished, one of them came to me and asked if I were a slave. I told him I was. He asked, are you a slave for life? I told him that I was. The good Irishman seemed to be deeply affected by the statement. He said to the other that it was a pity so fine a little fellow as myself should be a slave for life. He said it was a shame to hold me. They both advised me to run away to the north, that I should find friends there, and that I should be free. I pretended not to be interested in what they said and treated them as if I did not understand them, for I feared they might be treacherous. White men have been known to encourage slaves to escape, and then to get the reward, catch them and return them to their masters. I was afraid that these seemingly good men might use me so, but I nevertheless remembered their advice, and from that time I resolved to run away. I looked forward to a time at which it would be safe for me to escape. I was too young to think of doing so immediately. Besides, I wished to learn how to write, as I might have occasion to write my own pass. I consoled myself with the hope that I should one day find a good chance. Meanwhile, I would learn to write. 
The idea as to how I might learn to write was suggested to me by being in Durgan and Bailey's shipyard and frequently seeing the ship carpenters, after hewing and getting a piece of timber ready for use, write on the timber the name of that part of the ship for which it was intended. When a piece of timber was intended for the larboard side, it would be marked thus, L. When a piece was for the starboard side, it would be marked thus, S. A piece for the larboard side forward would be thus marked thus LF. When a piece was for starboard side forward, it would be marked thus SF. For larboard aft, it would be marked thus LA. For starboard aft, it would be marked thus SA. I soon learned the names of these letters and for what they were intended when placed upon a piece of timber in the shipyard. I immediately commenced copying them and in a short time was able to make the four letters named. After that, when I met with any boy who I knew could write, I would tell him I could write as well as he. The next word would be, I don't believe you. Let me see you try it. I would then make the letters which I'd been so fortunate as to learn and ask him to beat that. In this way, I got a good many lessons in writing, which it is quite possible I should never have gotten in any other way. During this time, my copybook was a board fence, brick wall, and pavement. My pen and ink was a lump of chalk. With these, I learned mainly how to write. I then commenced and continued copying the italics and Webster's spelling book until I could make them all without looking on the book. By this time, my little master Thomas had gone to school and learned how to write, and I had written over a number of copybooks. These had been brought home and shown to some of our near neighbors and then laid aside. My mistress used to go to class meeting at the Wilk Street Meeting House every Monday afternoon and leave me to take care of the house. When left thus, I used to spend the time in writing in the spaces left in Master Thomas's copybook, copying what he had written. I continued to do this until I could write a hand very similar to that of Master Thomas. Thus, after a long, tedious effort for years, I finally succeeded in learning how to write.